just said a really good thing that made me think. Willpower. Because a lot of people go through this cycle where everything that you're just explaining kind of negates the willpower because actually it's very hard to have any type of willpower when we're drawn in to will, everything the will, I'm that so you're pleased you bring this up. Like, the willpower argument, willpower has been the sort of the pillar. Mm-hmm. I mean, Frank, you know, I've spent, I've been broadcasting on the BBC for more than 15 years. Mm-hmm. And many, many years I did programs about weight loss. So I mm-hmm. did a, a program called What's the Right Diet for You? And we, this is, can you imagine this? We got like 100 volunteers. We weighed them all at the beginning. We weighed them all at the end. And then we set, we had a sort of cheer because they'd lost like collectively several hundred kilos. And it was, it was the kind of celebration of weight loss. It was fetishizing a particular kind of body. And it was telling the audience that if only they had this information, they could make the choices that would help them lose weight. Now, what we know now is that and, and this is this is painful to say. Without specialist intervention, mm. if you live with obesity, mm. it is a, nearly an incurable condition for many people. That's mm. why these drugs are, in some ways, a, a blessing. That's why we need to change the food environment. But it, and pe- everyone listening who's ever tried to lose weight will will there are a small number of people who have the resources and the motivation, the, the the external motivations that kind of force them to do it. But basically mm. for many people, it's an immovable object. So w- willpower arguments are dead, buried. They are scientifically, economically, morally, and uh, uh, socially functionless. They're, they're, they're wrong. And mm. this has nothing to do with willpower. I'm so pleased that you said that because this, there is so much as well emotion linked to food. And I think so many people beat themselves up trying to go on a diet that doesn't make them feel great doesn't kind of give them any rush that you're talking about and you might eat an ultra processed food and then what they might say is that they relapse and it it feels a very shameful area but when most of our supermarket shelves i think it's like three quarters are full of ultra processed foods it's quite a painful markets make their money painful environment though for somebody who is trying imagine being a smoker in the 1960s yeah and you're struggling, you want to quit, you started to cough, you've got a feeling it probably is the cigarettes, but everyone, you and I would be sitting here smoking, the techs would be smoking there, there'd be an ad break for a cigarette company, there'd be cigarettes outside, it'd be impossible for you. And, yeah, yeah, and it's, yeah. the, it's the same the same relationship. So, um, yeah, I, it, it feels very obvious to me that... The, I mean, the one thing I say in the book, I, I really... There are two really important things I think it's worth explicitly saying that I have no opinion on how anyone should live. You can live with excess weight and actually be perfectly healthy. Mm. I don't think that people should lose weight. Um, the book is not written to help anyone lose weight. Um, I don't even think as a population everyone should lose weight. I think if we shifted to a healthier diet, in fact, you know, living at a lower weight would be one of the uh, smaller benefits. You yeah, And... What's really important for people listening who live at what we, in a horrible way, call a healthy weight is if you're eating a diet high in ultra processed foods, even if you don't gain weight, you're still exposed to all the increased risks of dementia, anxiety, depression, inflammatory mm-hmm. bowel disease and on and on and on. So mm-hmm. it's this is not a discussion that's about weight. And I think resting diet related disease away from an obesity discussion is, is really important. And you do that very, very kind of skillfully. Thank you. I think people will also ask in this in this conversation one really big thing that I always like to bring up because I think exercise is fantastic for mental health. I mm. think it's great for getting you out. I think running outdoors into nature brilliant. it is amazing. Yep. It makes you feel brilliant. But you can't outrun a bad diet and I really believe that it's not equal that we do need to understand our is, diet it, it, and exercise. So you are so right. So it may maybe this. So I talked about you know my horrible trip up the Amazon. In a way, the chapter I most enjoyed writing was the one about exercise because I I started writing this book, and the subject that brings the, the reason that brings people to this this subject is for many people is living with ex- excess weight, mm-hmm. the shame and suffering, physical mm-hmm. and psychological mm-hmm. that that causes, and. Um, so I was curious when it comes to the discussion of obesity, and there is a discussion of that in the book, when we talk about weight, how much, when we talk about food, how much of the problem are we representing? And mm-hmm. I think when I started writing the book, I'm like, well, it's probably about 50-50 because we do all sit around and play computer games and watch TV. And I found these articles that really hard pushed the idea that most of the problem 
of obesity is because we are sedentary. Mm. And um, perhaps the most gratifying bit of the book was to reveal that that entire section of the scientific literature, uh, and I really mean like thousands of papers, was funded by Coca-Cola. And the institutes that they set up and the university departments they fund and the scientists they give money to. Um, and at the same time, we have some brilliant science going back mm. to the 90s, um, but kind of drawn together in 2012, 2014 by a guy called Herman Ponser, but um, uh, Amy Luke uh, and, and some other brilliant scientists have sort of backed this up, um, that when we do exercise, it doesn't change over the course of a year, the number of calories we burn very much. So if you are an Olympic rower or an Arctic explorer, of course it does. Mm -hmm. But for most of us going to the gym two, three times a week, it doesn't change the number of calories you burn. What it seems to be the case is the reason exercise is good for you is because you steal energy from other budgets. So so I have a pretty sedentary life at the moment. I've got, um, uh, you know, young children. I just can't fit in exercise. But I still burn about 3,000 calories a day. And I spend those 3,000 calories on anxiety, on inflammation, on horm high hormone levels. Mm -hmm. Now, when you start doing exercise, you take energy away from your anxiety budget, from your inflammation budget. And we think that's why it's good for you. So it's, it's, a, it's the most elegant chapter in the book, I think, because it's, it's in narrative terms. It's like, yeah, this thing that you all believe, it's completely wrong. It was all funded by Coke. Here's some better science. And there you go. And now let's get on with the story about the food. So I was... It's, uh, I'm boasting now, but anyway, I was, I was very no, pleased. No, but I loved it. It's a proper I, conspiracy, a proper conspiracy. Well, I do think it's important because I think it's so important to talk about exercise, but not, but not talking about it in a way that you can eat what you want and you can just run it off. Because I think that's also so misleading. And that's where sometimes the no, narrative has weight got is, to. Weight is, I would say, 90 to 95% to do with your, mm. what you put in your mouth and mm -hmm. maybe 5 to 10% to do with your activity level. Mm -hmm possibly even less mm -hmm. so we've gone through that it can be addictive we've gone through willpower doesn't exist we've gone through to look at the back of the labels to understand emuls emulsifiers flavors coloring can i say can i interrupt things. you willpower doesn't exist i think some listeners are going to be going well willpower does exist willpower <laughs> does not exist willpower is simply a function of your motivation and your opportunity and we know that if people have just loads of money and easy opportunities and all kinds of people sort of pushing them along, they get loads of stuff done. Mm. So people with, with money and resources. And it's people who lack the financial ability to buy this food and who are surrounded by it and have it aggressively targeted at them. So you, you are completely right when you mm. say, when you try and really study willpower and nail it down and go, let's operationalize this and do a study on it, it turns out not to exist. It's a mm. proxy mainly for poverty. Mm -hmm. So people who sort of get a load of stuff done, they're people who are born wealthy. Yeah. And people who live in poverty, actually, they make really sensible decisions. You know, if, if you live in poverty, taking opportunities when you can is a, is a smart thing to do. It's so really tough. I, sorry, I interrupted you. No. But will, willpower does not exist. But I love that. I mean, that's kind of something that I think a lot of people struggle with. And they feel an immense amount of shame when they can't do it. And yeah. that, I think, is really heartbreaking because it's not their fault. And that's why I'm so passionate about self-compassion <laughs> but I think after all of this people are going to go okay well what's the solution because if we're all consuming ultra processed foods they're really addictive they're really tasty they're cheap they're easy our supermarket shelves are basically driven for us to choose these products what do we do how do I get out of this mess well, there, are two, there are two answers maybe there are three answers but there's a kind of answer for the individual and there's an answer for the for the individual as a voter I suppose or for for, for policymakers who may be listening so for someone who is listening, who is mm. feeling addicted to this food, mm. my proposal to them, and, and we have good evidence this works for cigarettes and for mm. some other things, is don't stop eating the food. Eat what you like, but do read about the food. And if you mm. can't afford my book, you can listen to the podcast. You can go mm. and read B. Wilson's article in The Guardian for free. You can, there's mm. loads of information now. Mm. Read your ingredients list and ask yourself the question, is this food or is it an industrially produced edible substance? And you may find that your relationship with it changes. If you, if you stop forbidding things, it's very interesting how if you allow yourself the treat and you really savour it, this isn't food that stands up to mm. scrutiny. For many people, they will, they, will, they will be able to make that journey. Thank you so much for listening to the show. The link to the full episode is in the description. <laughs>